enjoy James Brown music, you're going to have a good time tonight. We are tonight celebrating Rock Velvet, James Brown Jr.'s 62nd birthday. Woo, 62! So right about now, put your hands together because we got a young man that's coming to the stage. He's been on the David Letterman Show. Put your hands together and meet and greet Black Velvet, James Brown Jr. <laughs> I've been playing James Brown since I was 14 years old. struggling for over 42 years trying to make it in the industry and at the age of 62 I'm just beginning to find my way through. I never made enough money to support myself in music but I'm hoping that this album will make a turning point for me that I can support myself in music. Hey man, I'm doing what? Hey. Hey man, that's my bird. Make me mad. I get mad, I get away from my go in the back room, close the door, and let him scream all he wanna. And they have my little stable place. It's not what I want, but thank God I got a roof over my head. When I go in my little apartment and lock my door, I'm in peace. But going into the projects, going into the elevator, getting in there. That's where the trouble starts. You never know what's gonna happen in those nights. The guy downstairs, his name is Alfred. Very good guy, don't bother nobody. The church guy, they shoot up his place. He showed me all the holes where they shoot up in the place. I said, wow, man. I said, oh, could live on the first floor. When it get too crazy at the projects, I go to my mom's house and I sleep in her basement. So I come here, and this is where I crash. Until the next day, I go take care of the errands, take care of things to keep a roof over both of our heads. I would like to get a little of this, like a little ball. Just put these in. Yeah, that's not rice. Let me see. Just a little bit more. I came from family of uh, eight. Um, main goal is watching over is my mom and do the best I can. It's my baby boy, and I love him. He washed my clothes. He cleaned his house. Valentine's Day, he bought me a box of candy. He just sweeps that candy as I sweep my ears. I'm just making her life peaceful and where she can not worry about the bills and everything. I took that up on my shoulder. And like really, I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but now I'm in it, I won't change it. So the only thing I can do is try to make something work where I can make a decent income, where I can live and let live. And that's all I, I can ask for life now.
That's a song from the new record, No Time for Dreaming. Charles Bradley and the Menahan Street Band. I can't believe you just came out of nowhere as a virtual unknown to us. Have you recorded before? No, this is my first time really coming out. I know you've been performing yes. as Black Velvet. Yes. So now you're performing as, as Charles Bradley. Yeah, yeah. Well, you certainly have a, a great band backing you here, yeah. and of course, with the folks over at Daptone, you know, what a great crew they are. And you've seen what's happened with Sharon Jones, who, yes. you know, yes. just like you, uh -huh. went from complete obscurity to who knows what kind of heights you could scale. So that's that's got to be an exciting moment for you. I thank God just answered my prayer. You know, it just like really... I asked myself why it took so long, but you can't question God when he want to do things. So at my late age, it's just started coming. What's next? I mean, are you thinking big? I'm thinking the sky's the limit. Congratulations to you on this great record. No matter what happens with it, it's a fine piece of work. Charles Bradley on WFUV. have ever been 62 years old and released their debut record. He may be the first. The guy is, is just getting it, getting it going as far as I'm concerned. He's worked very hard for a long time, and I'd hope that, that enough people can hear him sing so that, that he can make the kind of life for himself that he wants and take care of his family. <laughs> I went to Gabe because I thought that he knew what he was doing. I felt that he can give me a helping hand where I can get out into the music industry. All I knew how to do is get on stage and to perform. If you're into funk and soul music or Afrobeat and you live in New York, Gabe Roth is the guy that you want behind the board. This is the guys that you want pushing you in the direction because their records were phenomenal. I just started making the kind of records that I like listening to. I think a lot of those soul records have a certain sincerity to them that I always like. One morning, and I think it was pretty early, it was like 9 or 10 in the morning, I got a knock on my door, and it was Charles. And he said, I heard you were looking for singers. Well, I heard you were looking for me. I had no idea what he's talking about. So he shows me this videotape of him singing James Brown songs, and he sounds great, you know? Gabe Roth from Daptone Records brought him down to a rehearsal in Staten Island that we were having. And Gabe wanted us to record with a singer. So Charles was a singer that they had yet to find a band with on Daptone, but they had, Charles had captured their attention. I just figured, you know, see how Charles works with him, you know? Stop! I played with Tommy's uh, band that he had, over, had over, over in Staten Island. Dad just went over there one day and it was rehearsing, it was jamming, and they said, tell me, hey man, sing on this, sing on this, sing on this. And by me liking the music, I, the lyrics just pop in my head. So that all worked out well, and we recorded those songs with Bradley at Daptone. And uh, they were good songs, but they just didn't take off. And then we kind of went in different directions. Two years went by, and I was a um, handyman doing James Brown in small clubs. And then I got a call to come to, um, do a show with Sharon Jones. So we rehearse, we play the show, great. Me and Charles see each other for the first time in a couple of years. And, uh, you know, we catch up a little bit and I'm saying, hey, Charles, you know, I'm working on some music, so how about you come over one night and we give it a shot? And he said, yeah, Tommy, of course, you know. We magically recorded two songs in one night, one which was The World Is Going Up In Flames, and one which was In You, I Found A Love. I mean, Charles was right here, and I was right here, pressing record. And we, you know, we wrote it together, and, uh, and that was it. I mean, the music was laid down, but you know, he was just coming out with lyrics off the cuff, and I was just uh, putting it in the right place.
Charles. We haven't played so many shows with Charles up to this point. We played a couple. For Charles, you know, he wants to reach every single person in the audience. So what you, what we rehearse and what goes down on stage is two different things. I mean, the band is going to be tight, and the only thing we try to rehearse with Charles is to let Charles lead the band. and pains. You said eight, eight and a half, I get eight, now you want nine, you want nine and a half. What's wrong with that shoe right here? Oh, yeah, it's gonna drive me crazy. Oh, it's hard sometimes, it's very hard sometimes, because like, like everything now is really dependent on me. But if I put her in a home, she would die. I know that. I had a stroke one time. I had many heart attacks. But that heart attack come when my stepdad died and my grandmother died. And uh, when, when, when my husband died. Say, son, let me spend my last days in my house. I said, okay, mom. I do that, but she don't know I have no life. My life is her. For me to be with someone, I don't even know how to do it. When Charles' mother first left Florida to go to New York, Charles was only eight months of age, eight months old. And she stayed away so long that when she came back for the first time, he didn't recognize her, didn't know that she was his mother. He thought that his grandmother really was his mother. I came to the better myself for all of us. Me and my husband were separated. And I went to bed myself, and I did. I bought that home, 843 Willoughby Avenue. Mm -hmm. She abandoned, actually, in a way, her children to follow a man who had a wife that she was very crazy about. Otherwise, she probably never would have gone to New York. Well, I was about the age of seven or eight years old when I was age. My mother, when she came down, she, she told my grandmother, I want them to come back to New York with me. My grandmother said, no, let them stay down here because they are better off, they get a better education if they stay down here with me. So my mother says, no. So my grandmother said, no, you're not taking them. So my mother stole us. They were mine, so I feel like I got them. I may I create them so that I'm bring, give them, bring all of my creation back to New York with me. Mm-hmm. That's what I did. 
I really hate to say this, but I think at that time it was hard to find jobs, so there was only one way is you have some kind of dependence that you can get some welfare. And I feel like that's what she was doing, to get the welfare by having those kids there. And during his infancy, uh, now he was the, the favorite child. Uh, he received all of the, 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 the love and care from his older brothers and sisters and his grandmother and his uncle and all of us, because he was the baby. Uh, when Charles went to New York, I think that's when he lost all of that. I was living with my mom, and I was afraid that she was going to hurt me, so I left. We couldn't see eye to eye. It was like I was getting blamed for everything. So I was very bitter, and it seemed like everything was rational to us, and I was in a basement worse than this one. You know, it was just sand basement. There was no concrete basement. 15 watt bug light, and I said, no, I can't take this. I said, if I ain't want it, I'm going. That's why I left. I was 14 years old. My home was the subway train. That's where I can really keep warm. I get on the subway train, some nights or winter nights, cold, riding the A train back up and down the police and pop, 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 hit the darn thing real hard to say, can't sleep there, get off. I go across the, the, the platform, get another train going back. I sleep, get in the middle of the corner, and get the stick and knock on the thing real hard and peel it straight through my head. I said, can't sleep here. Get up, can't sleep here. So I just keep going different routes to get a night's sleep before daylight come. Then I would see myself was going down because everybody in that days was getting high using the hard drugs. And I'd be down there watching, holding up while they're shooting up and they try to give it to me. I got scared. And I was afraid of Neela. I said, no, 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 no. So that's when I heard a job call. And I tried to get my mother to sign me to go to job call. And she was mad with me. She wouldn't sign. So I got my sister to forge her name. And um, I learned how to cook. I cooked for two years as a cook trainee up in Bar Harbor, Maine. And that's where I started really doing Jane Brown on the job call. But they said, man, you see that new guy came in? He looked just like that guy they called Jane Brown. And then they got me fired up one day, gave me some gin. And Jocko, you were sneaking, you were supposed to sneak it in there. They gave me some gin, got me really hot, and they gave me the microphone, they said, sing. And I went crazy, so then they, they told me they're gonna take me to um, a girl's job call center to perform. I said, how many people is gonna be? He said, 20, 30 people. I said, okay. And they called me on stage. And I look at that stage and I saw all those people and I froze. I said, uh-uh, I ain't gonna there, not me, not me. So this guy named Moody came behind me and gave me a push. I see all the people was happy. They love me. They love me, giving them my heart. And I said, wow, this is where I want to be at. And I ain't never stopped. Our plans was when we got our job call, we was gonna get together and continue the music. My band got drafted into the Vietnam War. And um, they went on to the war, and I went when us completing my trade in the job call. I, I wanna taste that when you open that, uh, that was, was uh, a pumpkin. Oh, yeah. I got to taste that one. We can Just open that now. Pumpkin beer. I never heard of pumpkin beer. Oh, yeah. We can drink some of that. <laughs> I sure want to taste that. <laughs> OK. Oh, my god. This is delicious. That's the uh, Seriously. <laughs> this is pumpkin. unbelievable. That's a pumpkin? Yo. That's a pumpkin. It is like uncarbonated and flat. It tastes unbelievable. <laughs> you like it? No? No. You I don't like it? I, I guess I don't like it. <laughs> I think it's I'm delicious. Trying to, I'm trying to taste a pumpkin in there. Working with Charles Bradley as opposed to working with Sharon or Lee or somebody, the other singers from New York that I so often work with, you know, Charles has got the craziest stories. Craziest stories. So, you know, as a songwriter, I just sit around with, you know, and, and I hear Charles tell these stories, and you're just like, you know, we gotta 
write a song about that, man. So usually, b before we, we do the vocals on the track, I'll play Charles a song and just ask him if he likes it, first of all. And I'll sing him my ideas, you know, this is how I think it should go. And not that he disregards my ideas, but he's just got his own ideas and he just instantly starts expressing them. He'll just start singing and then we'll kind of stop and just get away from it for a second and just talk. And you start, you talk with Charles long enough and a story comes out about something. That without me asking him, he'll start singing about we just, what we just spoke about. And then I'll just grab a pencil and paper and let him kind of freestyle over the track over and over again. And then we'll go back and that'll become a song slowly, you know, over a course of a couple hours. But um, it's his stories that I'm always trying to translate into a song, you know. I went to California in 1977, searching for my dreams, music. I was bouncing into different bands like that. They said, man, we'll pay you $400 to do this tonight, this show, man. And this guy paid, his, paid me to do this tonight. That's how I was doing out there. And at that time, I don't know why, I got sick. I called my mom and she said, son, come on back home. Mom is getting old and uh, she been through a lot. And uh, it's not for me to crucify her for what she did in her life. So I came back to New York in 94. I was sick as a dog. I was close to death. It took me to Woodhall Hospital. I'm allergic to penicillin, and it was feeding me penicillin, and my body had shut down. I had gained up totally. Then my brother Joseph, he came, um, he came to the hospital to see me, and he reached over and he kissed me. He said, Charles, no, no. He was in my ear. He said, bro, if you don't want to live for yourself, please live for me. He said, Charles, I love you. You're my heart. I said, I said, Joe, I'll fight. I'll fight. My brother just told me, he said, Charles, now do something that you want to do. Follow your dreams. You love music, do it. And I said, Joe, I'd like to be smart like you. He said, no, brother, you can't be me. Don't never want to be me, be you. Oh, he did it. He devil just crow out of his buddy. He, do, he was crazy about Charles. He told Charles, whatever you do, do it good, brother, and stick with it. Don't let nobody talk you out of it. He told that before he died. He said, he said he said, don't let nobody talk you out of it. He said, because I can't do it like you do. I mean, I was a kid when I was in Florida. Showed that he was going to piano school. And how I learned these little things I'm playing on piano by watching him. He never learned about it. I just learned a little tools myself. He said, follow your dreams and your music. And he said, take one of these rooms in his house and fix it up in your music room. And having people come on and rehearsal. And that's what I did. So there was like a father and a brother. He was a beautiful brother. Um, I can move this and do this. You eat, and then we'll start slowly talking about what you did. Okay, I'm going to leave this right here for you. That's fine. I'm tutoring Charles. I would say he's probably at, like, a kindergarten or first grade reading level and reading comprehension level. Are the writers interested in my story? Okay, so you sounded it out. Did you understand everything that you read? Yes and no. Yes and no. I think his number one goal is for him to be able to write his lyrics down fast when they're coming into his head because he's got a lot of words up there that he wants to get out on paper, but he doesn't really know how to do it. We just spell and right? Okay. Um, oh, two N's? Just one N, no D. Oh, and. Because and is like when you put two things together, like. Right, okay. Fish and chips. Bye, Charles. We'll see you next week. Thank you.
guys. No. Three later. Wrap it up. Get it started. You know I own it. You know I'm the boss. <laughs> I bet you wish you were. Thank right, you, Mr. Brown. Charles used to wear his James Brown wig all the time, right? All the time. And as the record closed to an ear, it's like, Charles, you know, you got to present yourself as Charles Bradley. And he had a hard time. I mean, he wanted to come out with the cape and the James Brown thing and just be that, because that's what he's used to getting up on stage and doing. And we did not want that, you know? And we just wanted Charles to be Charles. And it took a lot of convincing for Charles to do that. Charles has a record coming out January 25th. So now starts the promotion leading up to the record coming out. I'm going on tour with Sharon Jones to open up for her. Sharon Jones is giving me a chance to expose some of my music to let the world know who Charles Bradley is. It's real exciting for us as a label to be able to present these kind of package de packages. And Charles is the perfect guy to add to any of the shows and get his name out on the heels of some of the other bands that have had success up to now. If we go someplace and we're able to have a thousand people come down to see Sharon, to be able to put him in front of that audience is, is a huge head start. So far, you know, the Sharon Joe's the Dap Kings has been our most prolific artist and our most successful artist. The artist has been around the longest, toured the most, and by far sold, you know, ten times as many records. <laughs> proper show in about a year so you know to also put that in context he hasn't played a lot of gigs as Charles Bradley working with Bradley live is a little stressful because he could kind of go off in the song anytime The juice is flowing for all of us. Thank you. He just blew the roof off the place. Unbelievable. You're going to be, like, huge, man. I don't understand what people mean about diva, you know, because that diva work can be, sometimes can be wrong. No, but it's right for you. Diva means, you know, you just want to show the pins. Yeah. 
When it's coming from love, you got to consider the source. When it's coming from love, you got to consider the source. You didn't say to Charles. You didn't say to Charles. Charles. Probably be already be on it now. Nah, I so, I got to get your and you, you have found a winner for me. And I wish the best for you. And what's the best for you? Best if for I don't, us. If I, don't, if I don't see you on the top, I will see you in heaven. Oh, you're going to see me. You're going to see me on the top and you're going to see me in heaven. <laughs> You'll see me while we down here, too. I love you, Sean. Love you, too, I'm gonna stop by and visit some old friends I haven't seen in many years. I know this guy, I know Ernest Washington since 1968. You know what she was looking for now? Mm. You remember when you used to wear the cape? You were oh singing God. one of James Brown's songs, and you throw that cape off. And I don't know if one of us went there and picked the cape up and lay it back on your shoulder or what. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. Yes, I remember that. That's right. You never know you went that far, huh? God, <laughs> man. You know, I thank God I, I didn't give up. Thank God. Let me speak to Tom. Tell Tom that to put Mr. and Mrs. Washington on the guest list. I found my friends. They are totally my family. We keep it tight. We may be going away for so far long, but eventually I'm going to find you back. Right. You know that, Jackie. Yeah, we've been friends for a long yes, time. Yes, yes, God, yes. Oh, yeah, Goosebumps, people thinking about that. Yeah. i see you guys. Okay. i see you tonight. Take care, and I'll see you tonight. All right, bud. Right. Oh, my God. That's memory lane. May ever who you are. I live here. I came here about Poughkeepsie about 1968. And I lived here for nine years. You know, this is like home to me. So I'm giving you my love. You know, Break it down, little sofa fellas. And I work at a little town they call Wasake. I work at a little center I was cooked for 3,500 people a day. There's a friend in here, two friends that I know that I, when I came here, they was with me. And his name is uh, Mrs. and Mrs. Ernest Washington. Ernest Washington, now, Mrs. I can't see you where you at, but. Thank you, brother, for the ride. Thank you, Jackie. 
Thank you for being my friend through the years. And all of you out there, I love you. down and started talking to people. Got touching. So I said, leave it alone, Charles. Getting too deep and I get off it. And I got back up. Cause it started getting touching. But um that was the beautiful thing about is there Ernest Washington and Jackie. Oh man. Wow, uh, this is the first time really saw me in many years. This is the house my brother was killed in. That's why I don't like to come in this block no more. He came downstairs and uh, he saw me cry. He smiled my eyes and said, just go next door. Charles, your brother's dead. He said, no, mom can't be. I said, yes, he is. So it's boy, a whole block of filled with policemen with rifles and guns. I look out the window and I saw all these police and the fire trucks, ambulance outside, so I came outside and I said, I got to go to see this myself because I saw this thing says MOG. And when it says MOG, what I did, I just um, came out to go in my brother's house and the detective would let me in there. But I told him that's my brother and you cannot stop me, so I pushed my way in. But I wish to God that I would have never would have did it. And they had uh, the boy in the back of the car. I said, give me your gun, Mr. Police. I said, I have both damn brains out right there. I said, yeah. He said, I can't do that. I said, good, good thing you can't give. I'll put, it, put every damn bullet in his head. And he robbed my son and got his money. I said, I'd kill his ass. And I meant it to him. Yes, sir. That's my baby. Mm -hmm. I love my baby. Sleep on, son, take your rest. God love you, but mama, I mean, mama love you, but God love you best and give you eternal rest. One day I will meet you riding the throne. Yes, I, yes, I will, son. I think uh, child depends on Joseph, just like his mother depends on him. Charles uh, lightning went out of his mind when Joseph got killed. I mean, he, uh, for a while they thought he was gonna go crazy behind him. And I really like to find the truth why he got killed. He was too young. He was 48 years old. There's a mic for you right here. Try that one, or you want to play something else? Yeah, we can come back. You're, you're old, and you always go. I can. Oh, you want to do uh, Heartaches and Pain? Yeah. All Heartaches and Pain is by far the deepest song on the Charles Bradley record. And uh, it was probably um, the third song that we had written together. Charles tells me this story about his brother. And Charles says to me, I want to write a song about my brother Joseph. I said, OK, I will help you do it, you know, as a friend. And, uh, and I said, you know that song on the piano you've been playing your whole life? That's going to be the music to the song. Brought Charles in and added a couple things to his piano thing, a couple chord progressions, whatever. He can say, hey, Charles, this is the song for your brother. And you know, he did his thing, man. He started screaming and running around. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And then uh, we started working on it. And it was hard, man. It was really hard. That is a, a really personal, deep, 
deep, dark, haunting story about Charles's brother, older brother that he admired and loved that he needed to tell. is hard on me because I, I, I don't think it's fair to me. Never miss the payment because they told me if I miss the payment, they're going to go up 18% on my interest rate. I've been trying to get a remortgage, remortgage. They tell me I don't make enough money. I said, well, how do I don't make enough money and I'm paying all this mortgage, high mortgage out because I'm going out to get every little pennies, every little place I can get pennies. Keep this going. When Joseph got killed and Charles went on and took over the poor duty of taking care of what mother needs. Because none of them wouldn't do it. Charles doing a lot of his personal money he puts into the house to help her to stay there. He's in the process, I would say almost, of buying this darn house for his mother. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, his older siblings that live there in the house don't want him there. And so he is largely responsible for taking care of all of my sister's uh, affairs. Mm -hmm. Hello? Yes? Oh, how you doing, Paul? She said, "If I, she don't be able to do, be able to do the learn the remote, the refinance the house, that she will, uh, have to wait until for two months to income tax come. And when income tax comes, she would like me to give up my apartment, but I don't want to give up my apartment, you know. And then I have to move on to my mom's house. Yeah, cause like this apartment, I said, but it's the only place I have to run to when I when I, when I get depressed, and this piece is only me in here. But what?" Ever you decide, because I know that you you're trying to help me, and I, and I appreciate that. All right, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Okay. What's left for me to do? It's my life. Take my life away. Sometimes I do. I say, God, just call me home, because every day I get out and I fight and fight to keep the honesty, the decency of a human being walking the planet and loving everybody as God asks you to love everybody. But they, this world today, look at it as a weakness, I think. How much more can one give before they find love on the planet? How much more can you give? I say, Father, when the time of the hour you want me, I'm ready to go. That's the way I feel about life. Before I leave this room, I said, let the world know they can't change me. I don't give a damn what you give me. There ain't no money on this earth. Can't take the love that I have for God in my heart. I love everybody. I never do nobody no harm. All I try to do is just walk my street life. We're traveling around Europe with Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings. And we had um, hung out one night and met some girls in Paris. So these girls were just like, hey, are, you know, is Sharon Jones as big in America as she is in, in France? And me and Homer were just like, no, no, you know, nobody knows about Sharon Jones. This is years ago. Like, nobody knows about Sharon Jones in America. It's like we play around Brooklyn and, you know, we play small clubs. But at the time, we were playing, like, theaters in, in Paris and such, and it was just, like, a bigger thing in Europe. So that led to us just kind of writing this little tune that night called Why Is It So Hard to Make It in America. The second that Charles sang 
why is it so hard to make it in America, the song's meaning completely changed. Say I owe so much, you guys. You bring this. Oh, Tommy, I see you. <laughs> this is what your band stuff. All right, Tommy. Tommy said um, they got me in the post on page six. Oh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> what can you say? <laughs> He's been doing a lot of struggling within himself, but it's gonna be okay today. It's gonna be over okay. We we've been talking for years, and I look at him and I and I say to myself, he's gonna be there after we pray. He in the paper? He's in the paper? I'm sitting over here talking to you in the paper? My lord. I'm about to hurt you. You could knock them on the door and told me that. I just thought I didn't want to go myself. <laughs> I told you, baby. I told you, baby. What? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love you. What? You told me. I told you. Who I told you to leave your head? It's happening. I told you. You told you keep the faith and never no, stop what? believing that you're already there. What you worrying about? No. You've been there and it's already done. Congratulations. God has been good. And if you cry, it's a good cry when you do hold your head up because he has you still. I love times. you, brother, and I won't forget. Tonight is my first night. Me only on stage, Charles Bradley. My chance finally come, and I'm hoping everybody out there will come up to show me your support. Tonight. You don't, you, you always tell me you're gonna come, you don't show up. This is the place where, before they fix it up, I lived in here for about, God, about two and a half years. It was abandoned. And it now is a church. The guy that owned it sold it and they fixed it up. But I, I stopped. This was home one time, and this guy, Jose, he is the one that really gave me electricity from his place, kept me going. That's why we're so close friend today. Tonight is the night 
that I truly find, do I keep going? Do I have it? That's what I'm looking for. Most people could have just given up and, you know, not done anything, just settled into a job, and, you know, he's just been plugging away doing music. It's hard enough for people in their 30s to launch a career. For someone in their 60s, it's almost insane. You gotta like rhythm and blues? We, we got to get our tickets. Ah, <laughs> uh, come on. I just hope it's a decent night. Some people turn out and, you know, he's got a room to perform to and feels good about the record because we feel good about it. Wow. Wow, sold out. I got it. That's right, I'm talking about no time for dreaming. Please welcome for the, to the stage, Mr. Charles Bradley. Put it this way, I was on the guest list and working for the label and friends with everybody in the band, and I had to wait outside like, I don't know, 25 minutes before I could even get in the door. It was sold out. <laughs> I got a special lady in the house. I think it's my mama. My mama's in the house someplace. Mama! Mama! Look around you in the, in, the, in, the, in the reel over there. I think that's my mama over there. But ladies and gentlemen, she gave me the star. right now you 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 made me to be the person I am thank you thank you I thank you and I hope to God that I can keep giving you love decency and honesty in my heart and give everybody a little piece to say I love you. It's one of my special shows. Oh, you changed, changed my life. You changed my life. It's infectious. You know, he's just in love with what he's doing. He's in love with his own. How can you not enjoy it? When he says, I love you guys, you feel amazing. I brought my friend from Italy. What do you think? I think it was too small a place for the people that came there. Cause a lot of people was turned down and it hurted me to see that. But for the joy, the love that the people gave me that was there, oh my God, they wanted more from me. And I felt that I look in the traces of their faces, oh my God, it was a teardropper.
knew the record was going to do real well, but I didn't know how quickly. It, it, people don't really know him that well. And the sales for a guy that's just putting out his first LP that not too many people know about, I mean, it's unbelievable. like really against the odds to be able to think that yes a 62 year old black man from Bedsty, Brooklyn is going to have his first record and within the first couple of weeks sell more than most records are selling in a year at this point so what i got to do i don't think it's a done deal and i don't think it's easy i think a lot more people have got to buy his record he's got to sing a lot more shows He's got to make a lot more records, you know, it's a long, it's a long path, you know, and he's a late starter. It's above any of our expectations already, and I think the record's got wheels. I don't think it's stopping now. I think we haven't even seen the biggest sales yet. to do some touring over there, and I hope that the real Europe will love what I'm doing, what I'm giving it to them. Now, it's clean as a baby's tail. So how long will you be going, baby? Uh, three weeks, man. Three weeks, baby? Yeah. Uh-uh. Uh -uh. You live right here. Every three days, I'm going to call you. Okay, that. Okay, we'll be... Okay. 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 <laughs> You got no water throw me now. <laughs> you got no water throw me now. <laughs> you got no water. I can pick on you. I can pick on you now. And like what my mom said today, she never believed that I would get this level. I want to see how far can I make myself go in life. See, can I go as further than any of my family members ever been and say, I took me there. I'll take the long road. Young people out there, watch out. That old man is coming up for you. Gotta do your job better if you don't, I'm gonna do it for you. I'll take the long road. Yeah, yeah. Take that shortcut. I'll take the long road. I don't mind. You can take that shortcut. I'll take the long road. You can take that shortcut. Yeah, yeah. Good love. But I'm sure that surely, surely I will get there.